Hi, y'all. Good to see everybody here today, and for those that are worshiping with us online, we welcome you to our service today as we gather here to worship the Lord. Uh, I have a few announcements, but before I get to the announcements, I wanted to share a couple of things with y'all just as a way of kind of waking us up with a little humor before we move into worship. These, uh, some of these things uh, were found on some church bulletins, and I thought y'all might appreciate it. Ladies, don't forget the rummage sale. It's a chance to get rid of those things that are not worth keeping around the house. Bring your husbands. Uh, Miss Charlene Mason sang, I will not pass this way again, giving obvious pleasure to the congregation. <laughs> the pastor will preach his farewell message, after which the choir will sing, break forth into joy. And then here's the last one. This being Easter Sunday, we will ask Ms. Lewis to come forward and lay an egg on the altar. <laughs> there's a couple of more that are really funny that will probably see in the newsletter, but there's one of my, I thought was hilarious, but I'm not going to read it from the pulpit. <laughs> Don't forget, we do have our meal following the worship service today. I hope that y'all have uh, uh, a good appetite. It smelled mighty good as I walked by a while ago. Uh, and so looking forward to that. And then don't forget, at 6 o'clock tonight in this very room, we're going to have the Glory and Grace dance team here to perform for us. Again, we're going to be doing some things once a month on Sunday evenings just to help us have some extra things going in our church uh, that we think you might enjoy. Uh, we're going to have some singings later on. Again, uh, the family ministry team is going to plan some things for the summer. So I hope y'all come and support this tonight. Uh, I think it promises to be a really good time. Are there any other announcements that need to be uh, lifted up this morning? Well, let's begin our service with prayer. Father God, we ask that you help us to get ourselves out of the way, that you could help us to worship you, and that you would speak to our hearts, and that you would be glorified. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Beautiful song, choir. We'll join our voices in singing when Jesus came to Jordan. Speak the vital sin. 
I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? I believe in the Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Do you believe that he rose from the dead? I believe that on the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Do you believe in God's Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now sing together, Lord of the Dance, verses 1, 2, and 3. into prayer. Y'all see those pictures right there? We had uh, about 12, uh, 13 or 14, wasn't it, Wednesday night, Brenda? How many? 16. Now, I know we had this demographic study that came out that said that we're reaching or should be reaching our community and our community is mostly older people. So does that mean we don't have any children? in Rainbow City more? I think that proves different. 
How many of you think it's important for us to influence the lives of children for Jesus Christ? All right. We have, I put this up before the prayer concerns because we do need to be praying about it. We need some more people to help Peggy uh, so that on Wednesday nights we have some extra teachers so that she's not trying to do that big a class on her own. Sherry may need some for the youth. Also, we're going to try to get our, uh, our program back to having a, on Sunday morning, where we have a children's church. We want to have that prepared again so that we can reach the gospel for, with our two children. But also, as y'all may know, uh, Peggy will be leaving us in July. She's getting married in May, and she's going to stay with us through July. The SBRC is going to be trying to find and hire a new children's director. We need a lot of prayer about that, and if you know of anyone, uh, you need to see Olivia and let her know about that. And then tomorrow night, the uh, leadership of the We Angels program will be meeting, and we need your prayers that God will send us the perfect person to lead the We Angels program. We Angels is a very important outreach program of our church, but as you know, we live in an age where not only is it we want to continue the outreach, but that is a very important job to make sure we do everything as it should be so that we would not get any kind of legal ramifications. And so I ask, again, for your earnest prayers about that, uh, and if you know of anybody that may be interested, uh, you need to let uh, me know, and I can get that on to the We Angels board. And finally, we need to pray for the people on this side of the church. <laughs> Apparently, this side is doing a really good job of evangelizing, but this side, y'all need to step it up a little bit, y'all. As y'all hear me lead us through the prayer, I hope that you will feel free to join in. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you on this Sunday morning, and Lord, I don't want this prayer time to be just a routine where I say the same old, same old. Lord, I want it to be a heartfelt prayer from all of us. For Lord, we need you. And so Lord, this morning, I want to kind of lead us through a prayer time so we all have an opportunity to pray. Father, I want us to first to start by reflecting on the things that we should praise you for. And Lord, I'll start it out. I praise you, Lord, that Bridget and I are going to have another grandchild, a little girl in September, and that we will have, that, that this will be number 11 for us. And I praise you for that. Uh, well, Lord, I want to open it up now for praises from my brothers and sisters. No one in the room has something to praise God for. Yes. Anyone else? I praise him for the love that my family shows me. Uh, it's, it's just beyond my comprehension. Father, we also come and with things on our heart today. Lord, I think we need to pray about our world in our country. And so, Lord, I, I'm just going to give my brothers and sisters an opportunity to pray what's on their heart regarding that issue. Anyone? People in our district are being kind, elderly, and suffering. Yes. Yes. Anyone else? Father, I would pray that as a nation we would seek your face in leadership uh, 
So, Lord, our country and our world needs to be paying attention to what you say to us. And, Father, we also gather here today to pray for individuals that are on our hearts, that we love, that we care about, and so we lift them up to your throne of grace because we know that you are God. You made these persons. You love these persons. And so, Lord, we just turn now in the prayer time for lifting up those that we have on our hearts this morning. Any others? Yeah. And Father, I want to pray for those people that think they don't need you, but they really do. I want to pray for those persons who, because of situations in their life, feel abandoned, and yet they're not. And I pray for those persons in nursing homes and in sick beds that years ago when they were younger, they could get up and do anything, and now they just have to live their life out in in a bed or in a chair. God, I pray that you would bring them comfort and be with those who are caring for them. Now, Lord, I just ask that you go with us the remainder of this service and may what is said and done become from you and not from us. We ask this in the precious name of the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. together as we join in giving our tithes and offerings. If the ushers would please come forward.
line from last week? What are we supposed to say? Praise the Lord. Choirs, y'all coming down, if you don't already have family on this side, would you help this side out a little bit? I don't want to make them feel too bad. get an extra plate of food. Okay, our scripture reading, our overarching scripture reading, very, sounds a lot like the one from two weeks ago, but it's tied to a prayer a common theme of the prayer that Paul had for the church in Thessalonians as well as Ephesians. But today's text says, May the Lord bring you into an ever deeper understanding of the love of God and the endurance that comes from Christ. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How many of y'all used to like or still do like going in the summertime when it's hot to go swimming, get out in the water? I, I love to go swimming, but there's a one problem I have about swimming. I don't know how to swim. <laughs> so what I do is I love to go out kind of deep, maybe this deep, but I don't want to get so deep that my feet can't touch the bottom. I want to know that I'm still somewhat of in control of the situation. So I have reluctance to go out deeper. Think about that. Isn't that the problem sometimes we have as Christians? We're afraid to go deeper with God because we're afraid that we won't be in control. And basically, we still enjoy having control over our life. To turn it all over to God means that we'll have to change the way we think about things. It may mean we may have to let go of things that we don't feel like letting go of. And so what we tend to do is we'll get just so deep with God and then we'll stop there. And yet Paul, when he prays for churches... He, one of his prayers is that they would learn to go deeper in the love of God. And I thought it was interesting as I studied for the sermon to find that he said this, the church of Ephesus, and now to the church in Thessalonica. I can't pronounce it really well. But you know, it really occurred to me that when you read Paul's prayer about that, that prayer is really for us too that down through the ages, the Apostle Paul, the great evangelist, the great orator, the great apologist, the one called by God to speak to the Gentiles, is praying for us that we would go deeper with God. Now, as we know, last week we had a stop. Our ideas came and brought a message. And you think about it, it really tied to the theme because he talked about not changing the ancient markers, but I want to return back to the theme. We've got uh, we we've been talking two weeks ago about how we go deeper, and I'm using the book of Joshua as a, some examples from Joshua about how you learn to grow deeper with God in your relationship. And two weeks ago, I said this uh, sort of as a way of uh, reviewing that we have to have a spiritual mentor that we have to learn to recognize and heed the voice of God. We need to be willing to step out on faith, and we need to become familiar with the Word of God. Yet, we struggle with that. Let's just be honest. I don't want these sermons to be like, okay, the preacher said this, let's go home and forget about it. Because, you know, the truth of the matter is, though we believe in God, sometimes we struggle 
really trying to fully surrender and trust him. We're more like what the psalmist says when they say, he says, some trust in horses and some trust in chariots. We tend to trust in things like money, economies, government, church, and world leaders. But how's that working out for us? Not too good lately, is it? And yet the, same, the psalmist that said that also says, some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. So how do we do that? We're going to look today some more things from Joshua. Now, for those of you who have stepped into the modern age, whip out your, your Bible app, and for the rest of you, which I still prefer a Bible, but this one be quicker, uh, look with me on Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4. And the point I want to make here is that to go deeper, we have to never forget what God's already done for you because what Satan will try to do is you go deeper, he will try to pull you back into shallow water. So here is what Joshua 4, 1 through 7 from the New Living Translation says. When all the people had crossed the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Now choose twelve men, one from each tribe. Tell them, take twelve stones from the very place where the priests are standing in the middle of the Jordan. Carry them out and pile them up at the place where you will camp tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had chosen one from each of the tribes of Israel. He told them, go out in the middle of the Jordan in front of the ark of the Lord, your God. Each of you must pick up one stone and carry it on your shoulder, which means it wasn't a little bitty pebble. Uh, twelve stones in all, one for each of the twelve tribes. We will use these stones to build a memorial. In the future, your children will ask, what do these stones mean? And you can tell them. They remind us that the Jordan River stopped flowing when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant went across. These stones will stand as a memorial among the people of Israel forever. Two weeks ago, we talked about the fact that they crossed the Jordan River. God had stopped it at flood stage. And now God is telling them to set up a big memorial that their and their descendants could look upon this memorial and remember the great work that God had had. And you know, that's why the Jews still, uh, still have Passover every year, to remember the Passover mentioned in Exodus. And to some degree, it's not the full meaning, but that's why we have Holy Communion is to remind us for what God has done in the past. And you know, it occurs to me that whenever we come across a difficult or scary time in the life of the world or in our own lives, Satan tries to pull us back. He tries to keep us from going deeper. He wants us to stay in shallow water because he wants us to doubt God. But in those times, we have to reflect back on what God has already done. We're living in a world right now where the whole world is scared because of the actions of one maniac. And yet, there is a man who is also God, who's also God, is way stronger than this person. And this God got our, got our world through a time when someone like Adolf Hitler was ruining the world. He got us through the Great Depression, didn't he? Or let's bring this a little closer to home. Uh, how many of you, in all honesty, ever struggle with self-doubt, feeling like you will never measure up, that you will never really become even close to what God wants you to be? Come on, be honest. I I'm there right with you. When those times happen, 
We have to remember what God has already done. I'll give you an example. Let's suppose that wall over there represents where God wants us to be, and this wall over here represents where we used to be. Where am I? Right in the middle. I'm not, I haven't arrived yet. So sometimes I feel like I'll never get there. I always mess up. We all just things in our lives just not like where they ought to be. We know God wants us to be better. So we can dwell on the fact that we're not there and beat ourselves up. Or we can look this way and remember how far God has brought us. We have to remember the times of things that God has done for us and how God has brought us through difficulties before. And so, I'm going to do what I did in the other service. Can I get a witness this morning? Is there someone here brave enough to share a quick, quick sentence or two of how God has brought you through something bad in the past, and therefore you know he'll get you through something in the future? All right, brother, let's hear a witness. Thanks be to God. Anybody else? Can I get a witness? Amen. Anybody else? Can I get a witness? How has God sustained you in the past? Amen. And that is one of the most difficult things a parent would ever go through. Amen. Amen. Folks, we have to remember as we think about Joshua's story, what God said. Set up something that you can look back on and see, I have been there. Secondly, if we want to go deeper with God, we have to do what God asks even when it's uncomfortable. Look with me in Joshua chapter 5. And I'll tell you like I tell the earlier guys, fellas, please try not to cringe when you read this. Y'all know what a flint knife is? That's a knife that they take out of a flint rock and carve a sharp edge to it. At that time, the Lord told Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise this second generation of Israelites. So Joshua made flint knives, circumcised the entire male population of Israel and Gil at Gilbreth, Halalah. We read through those words like, okay, so what? But that would have been a very difficult thing. Flint, not clean, sensitive part of the body, a lot of pain, no Novocaine. And we have to remember that circumcision was to show the Israelites belonged to the old covenant God had with them. Much like baptism is a sign of the new covenant. But the men of this second generation had a choice. They had to do what God wanted, which means they were really saying yes to God's covenant, or no, it's too painful. And so they chose to do what God asked. Folks, there may have been time in our past, and there will be time in our future. When God may call us to times where we have to suffer, and that has been the case throughout human history for the faithful of God. People who have died because they refused to go what God, what, against what God said. And so what happened? As Terry mentioned to us last week, 
worldly stones begin to be thrown at them. And it is those times we have to choose. Will we stand on God's word and take whatever is thrown at us or shut up, be quiet, and give into the world? Sometimes God may call us to do something that is risky. Let's take, for example, the book of Esther. I'm going to move away from Joshua's story for a minute because I want to show you how some women of the Bible did this also. The book of Esther. Esther lived during the time of the Babylonian captivity. She ended up marrying the, the king of Persia, King Xerxes. But just because she was queen didn't mean she just could march into his presence. Well, a man named Haman was a guy that hated the Jews. And he tricked King Xerxes into having all the Jews murdered. Esther's uncle, whose name was Mordecai. I told somebody earlier I had a cat named Mordecai one time. But anyway, Mordecai knew about this scheme, and here's what he said. He sent this note to her. If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will arise from some other place, but you and your relatives will die. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. To walk into the king's presence without being invited was to be killed. She had a choice. Take a risk to do what God would have her to do to save her people or take care of herself. Here's what she said. Go and gather all the Jews of Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days or not. My maids and I will do the same. And even though it's against the law, I will go in to see the king. If I must die, I am willing to die. How about Rahab? We're going to be talking about Jericho in a minute. Rahab, the woman that lived in Jericho. Of course, we, we know how what she's known for, uh, but we forget what she becomes known for later, a woman of faith. Because Rahab had heard about the God of the Israelites, and she had come to believe he was the one true God. So when the Israelite spies come into Jericho, she sticks her neck out for God by taking those spies into her household, knowing that if the people of Jericho heard about it, they would kill her. She trusted more in the Lord God than she feared the people. How many of us are willing to stick our neck out for God? Remember that when we go through bad times, persecution, whatever may come our way for doing what God asks of us to do, we have to remember the two, two things in the scripture that have popped in my mind the Lord brought to me. One for, from the book of James. God blesses those who patiently endure testing Afterwards, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. But how about Psalm 30, verse 5? Weeping may last for a night, but what comes in the morning? We may be heading to a time in our country where Christians may very well be under a time of great scrutiny. It's already happening around the world. But we have to remember, no matter what, we hang tight to Jesus. No matter what we go through in this world, what we will get with him is way better than any trouble we will suffer here. And finally, if we really want to go deeper with God, we have to trust God to do the impossible. Now, do we really, I want you to think about this for a minute. Do you really believe that this God that you've heard about all your life, that you cannot see, actually brought everything into being that you can see? Did he really create the world? Did he really make humanity out of the dirt of the ground, or did he make a, did we just evolve from apes? Did he allow his son to walk on water? 
Did he raise his son from the dead? Can God do the impossible? Or is God just simply, or are we just simply what would be called closet deists? We believe that, yeah, God did all that, but God has nothing to do with the world anymore. That's what's been happening in our country. Really, if you trace it back, it's further than just in our country. Back around right, right as the Middle Ages began to end and we moved into the time of enlightenment, I learned uh, from an article I read that a lot of the poets and philosophers and even theologians began to distrust that there was a God. They said, even if there is a God, he doesn't care about us. But what really happened in the United States and across the world where this accelerated to the loss of faith in God and it led to the God's dead movement and all that stuff was World War II. During World War II and the dropping of the two nuclear bombs and when we saw how the Jews were treated to see how horribly humanity, humanity could treat other people, a lot of people began to lose faith in, that there was a God. And so many denominations began to say there's no such thing as miracles. There's no such thing as a virgin birth. No such thing as Jesus walking on water or raising the Lazarus, raising Lazarus. And matter of fact, this whole resurrection of Jesus, that is simply a myth to prop up another religion. And why do I think we are not seeing God do the impossible in our country as much as we would hope to and maybe we still do in third world? Is we have come to a point where we rely more on human wisdom and not on godly faith. The Gospels tell us that Jesus didn't feel, heal many people in his own country. Why? Because they refused to believe. They thought they knew better, and that's where we're getting as a country. We know better, and yet Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians that I will destroy human wisdom and discard their most brilliant ideas so where does this lead the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made them all look foolish, for he has shown his wisdom to be useless nonsense. Joshua and the Israelites had already seen God do the impossible, but now they were going to get to see him do it again. If you will turn with me to Joshua 6, 1 through 5. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people uh, were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or out. But the Lord said to Joshua, I've given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the, the, march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times and with the priests blowing the horns. And when you hear the priests give one long blast on the wrong ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. And the walls of, Jer of the town will collapse and people can charge straight into the town. Now, I did a little research this week online. I wanted to find out what do we know about the walls of Jericho. Archaeologists, based on what they found, tell us that the walls were basically six foot wide. In other words, the base was six foot deep from the front to the back, and they were 12 feet tall, made out of block or rock. It would have been a very solid thing. The Jews did not have a wrecking ball. God didn't give them any big plan for them to chisel into the wall. 
Instead, God says, Y'all, all I want y'all to do is walk, toot your horn, and shout. <laughs> we tried doing that today. People would be like, we need to put them in there somewhere, don't we? Keep them safe. And that's what they did. Why did God do it that way? Because God, remember, these people had distrusted God, and he again wanted to see if he would obey, they would obey. Would they trust him to do the impossible? And when they did, what did God do? The walls came down, and they, they were victorious over their enemies. Which makes us ask the question, is there anything too big for our God to handle? If he can take a rock wall in Jericho and take it down, if he can take the worst sinners and turn them into saints, if he can raise his son from the dead, if he can speak and the galaxy comes into being, is there anything too difficult for our God? God did something that we also don't think about that's impossible. Would have normally been impossible. And if our God was like the Greek gods or some of the other gods, it would have been. But our God is a true God. God is high and holy. We are sinful. Great chasm. But what does God do? He breaches that chasm on our behalf. God, who is spirit, become human, that we might become saved. And though we want and look forward to and would love to see some of those giant miracles like walls collapsing, have you ever thought about there's a miracle that happens every single time a sinner says yes to Jesus Christ? For their lives are moved from hell and moved into eternity. That is what our God can do. And so, folks, if we want to go deeper with God, we need to return to the faith of the New Testament church, a belief that our God can change the world, that he can make a difference, that he does indeed exist. And I ask this of us this morning. Are we wanting to go deeper with God at any expense that it may cost us? Or do we want to make excuses? Are we going to trust him to take care of us no matter what? Let's pray. Father, we live in a world in a time that just feels so unsecure, uh, so topsy-turvy. But, Lord, we need our faith to be solid. We all admitted a while ago that we know we have not arrived at where you want us to be, and sometimes we feel like we don't measure up. But, God, we know that none of us really measure up. It's what you did through Jesus is the reason why we're saved. But, Lord, I pray this morning, if there's anyone in this room struggling with doubt, discouragement, depression because of things going on in our world, if there are people in our congregation that have family members that are going through difficult times, the Lord, we would be honest enough to say we need to pray about it. And Lord, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would open up this altar to those who need to come to pray for whatever reason. And so we give this time over to you. Come Holy Spirit and work in this place. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we stand to sing, if the Lord has put a need in your heart to come pray about what, what you feel like the Lord has spoken to your heart or for someone else you need to pray for, the altar is open if you would like to come and pray. Let us sing together, I Surrender All.
Tom, how are you? Good to see you. 